Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of At The Table. And today is one of my favorite days, one of my favorite episodes that has been on the books for a while. And I am so, so pumped for this conversation with my sister, my friend, man, um, a spiritual mother to so many of us, Beth Moore. Beth, welcome to the show. <laughs> Jackie, this is so long overdue that it is ridiculous. I, I am so <laughs> happy to see your beautiful face on this screen. Oh, well, I am pumped that you're carving out some time to talk with us and share a little bit of your story and kind of dig into some of the leadership lessons and just things that I think I've learned from you along the way. And hopefully I'm sure just some new things as well. So um, as you are following along this season, you know that we're going through my book, The Calling of Eve. And when you got to the chapter of women in the church, you read about Beth, not that she needed an introduction, um, but I used her and her story as an equivalent to Deborah and just working alongside faithfully where she is and just how God has blessed her. Yes. How God has blessed um, just using her in different seasons of life, not only the hard and the heavy, but also just getting to see God work and move in beautiful ways and pave pathways for so many women along the way. And I know I'm a beneficiary of that. I'm sure those of you that are listening um, are beneficiaries of that. So why don't we go back to the beginning? So you just released your memoir several months ago and yes. I got to listen to it as a road trip and um, love the accent, by the way, and <laughs> being able to kind of um, identify some of the places now that I'm in Arkansas, just where you grew up and all of those things. So why That's don't you right. kind of take us back to childhood, some of your story and just the fun, get to know you questions of growing up as an Arkadelphia girl. I, I love that question. And I was thinking as you were bringing that uh, introduction, I just love that, Jackie. It seems like a simple thing when you say that God blesses that yes, but I, I think that that would be as much a topic and theme of my very, very uh, turbulent and up and down and around um, journey with God in ministry, as I could possibly say, is it just that just yes to the next season and yes to the next. So I just want to tell you that is a word all by itself. I consider myself an Arkansan. And there there are reasons for that. For one thing, even though I have lived in Texas since I was 15 years old, and so I don't mind telling you that that is way over half my life. <laughs> the majority of my life has been in Texas, but there are a couple of things that make that true. And one of them is that I am deeply, deeply rooted there because my great grandparents, my grandparents, all my great uncles and aunts, all my whole extended family behind me is is buried there. That that's where we came from when when our people, when my ancestors immigrated to the United States. They went down through North Carolina, moved across, and they settled in that part of Arkansas. So, but not only that, in Texas, it is the oddest thing. You never feel like you're really a Texan if you weren't born here. I, and I'm talking about, I'm in a family of Texans. So my husband, fourth generation, not only Texan, Houstonian, fourth generation. <laughs> My kids are Texans to the bone. And so, you know, I'm the odd man out because, you know, I got here too late, even though it was 15 years old. So, and I think that my sort of the way that I think, the way that I cook, um, a lot of my colloquialisms, even though I will try to manage my accent, I don't mind telling you, when I did the audio book, Jackie, and I, I told my publisher, I said, I'm, I'm afraid this is going to get annoying, but I said, I can't, I can't do the part in my early childhood without doing the accent that went with it, or it's not true. Mm -hmm. So, so, but it was very easy for me to go back because it's a natural, it's a, it's a natural language for me. So um, I'm very thankful to have been raised there in those hills and in those seasons and uh, even though I wouldn't trade or transfer to Houston for anything, that's where the rest of my life has been. I still love my Arkansas heritage. I love my rural heritage, even though my family, Jackie, always lived within the city limits. And when I was a little bitty kid, barely, barely in the city limits, we were definitely out in the hills. But by the time I was in grade school, we had had moved in town. But 
my people were all from rural Arkansas. So my grandparents, my grandmother who lived with us. So that's yeah. someone impacting you know, your life every single day. And then my, both of my parents were raised in rural Arkansas. So I don't, I'm not just Arkansan, I am rural Arkansan. <laughs> so, and not, not unhappy to be. So I, I love, love cornbread and I love ham. So. <laughs> Yes. I love it. Well, and as somebody that was born and raised Texan that is now in Arkansas, it's been kind of a fun flip. And I did. I loved digging into your story and being able to just put together pieces of the Caddo River and Arkadelphia and the hills. It really is beautiful. We traded places, Jackie. I know, I know, that, is that is crazy. Do you still do you consider yourself a Texan? I mean, you said it correctly. Yes. I mean, yes. if you're born and raised Texan, you're a Texan. With the irony yes. of is that until we moved here and then I went back home to do a speaking engagement, I didn't realize how Texan Texans are. And like, we really <laughs> love our flag. We love fried things. I mean, all the things. I was like, okay, I get, I get what the rest of the planet is saying now. about. <laughs> no. Yes, you have to get out of it and come from the outside to see it. Yeah. Because none of my Texas bred friends realize that they're weird. I, I just, you know, I'll just gaze off when it goes there. You know, I just try to gaze <laughs> off and act like I think they're normal, but they don't, they feel completely normal. <laughs> I, it's normal to us. It's our, it's our kind of crazy. Yes. So, well, yes. I, I love just your humble beginnings and even your storytelling. I think it was a different shift from, you know, the other studies and things that I had kind of worked through in that memoir it was such a beautiful piece of walking through God's faithfulness in your life. So let's kind of start at, I think um, you're already in Texas, you're teaching, you're a young mom. Mom, and then yes. you're teaching an aerobics class and then yes. teach devotionals with that. And that really is kind of one of the starting points, not the starting point to just your ministry and God using. Absolutely. So take us back to kind of that moment in your life and you're a young leader, you're a young mom, and there's not necessarily a lot of landscape for women in the church. Oh the gosh, no. So Gosh, no. talk through like some of those insecurities, like what did you, what did you feel? What did you fear? What was that like? You know, I did whatever was just before me because I didn't know what else to do. And mm -hmm. so when I was 18 is when I surrendered to what we would have called in our denomination, you know, vocational um, ministry. So I, I surrendered, but I had no idea what it was going to look like. I had no idea what I was surrendering to. And the, the wonderful thing about that, Jackie, and I, I want so much for this to encourage someone um, tuning in with us today, is that I didn't surrender to a particular ministry. I surrendered to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so that has been really helpful to me because sometimes we can get really really messed up if a particular role doesn't pan out for us and we think but i surrendered to that when really he's going like what i want you to do is just move with me where i'm going and just follow me just follow me surrender to me and so that that's all i knew to do so when i got married right after college really just even finishing college i still had my student teaching to go uh, i had women from my church. This was at the very, very beginning of the 80s when, I mean, aerobics was the absolute thing. I mean, the thing. And it was just breaking out. And so some of the women at my church, because Jackie King, I had been in drill team. Now, this is what made them think that I was qualified to teach an exercise class, that I had been in drill team. Beth, you need to teach us an aerobics class. I don't know how to teach an aerobics class. Well, you can find out how. Well, I didn't know, and I'll make this, uh, this story short, but I didn't know anything else to do but to do it as ministry because I had already made my commitment that whatever I was going to do, to, as well as that 21, 22, 23-year-old could understand, I wanted to do it as a way to minister to people. And so I did, I choreographed it all to Christian contemporary music. These were the big days. This was Amy Grant, Michael W. Smith. This was all of the, or Petra, I could go, groups you've never even heard of. I have, Jackie, I've that were, those people. <laughs> okay, okay. So this was those days way back then. And it was so fun. We had the best time and it just, turned us, I, I still run into some of those women. And 
I, I taught for 12 years and even from the very early stages of it, I was already starting to speak. And then I started to teach Sunday school. So for as long as I could handle doing both, I did because I've never done anything that was just more flat out fun. Mm -hmm. And we, as crazy as this sounds, we learned to worship because we would sing. I would tell them in order for them to breathe, because I did go get training. And in order to keep them breathing so they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't take themselves beyond, so they wouldn't faint dead mm -hmm. in the floor on me in the middle of an advanced class, um, I, we sang, we sang. So we would sing to those songs as we worked out to them. And it just turned us into worshipers. And then we would sit down afterwards and we would just trade prayer requests. And it, it was, I don't, this is so silly to look back on and to try to explain to someone, but I think that the Lord thought we were fun. Mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. We were just obnoxious. We could <laughs> shout. We could do anything because we were behind closed doors. There were no rules. There was and because when where I was raised, you know, we never lifted our hands or anything. Well, we in this class, we were way, way past lifting our hands, way past because we were dancing. Yeah. Um, to the music, worshipfully mm -hmm. and modestly, but we were, we flat out were dancing and it, it was a blast. It was hard to give up and I didn't give it up until the Lord just like pressed on me and pressed on me. And what would be next in ministry would have been that I started writing curriculum then, mm -hmm. but I didn't know that when I left, I would have, I'd still be doing it if I could have been. <laughs> I'd be doing the seniors class now, Jackie. Oh, hush, whatever. I would. I, I would. love everyone who's trying to picture you singing and me even being in a class like that, trying to like gasp for air and sing yes, and, for air. and all the things. So yes. um, I love just the simplicity of that and just the pure joy, like even joy. especially knowing the decades of ministry and hard work and um, which I know we're going to get into this, but how it started with so much joy and so much love and just enjoying one another, which is a big yes. part of what God wants us to do with one another as the church and as women. And so and this, in the, the blast, the, Jackie, you, you know this, and it's one of the things that God uses to keep us in it, but there's just nothing that is more fun than a group of women. Mm -hmm. I mean, nothing, nothing. If they'll, and I feel this way in Bible study and I'll, I'll tell my groups when I speak, okay, I'm a long way from that aerobics teacher, but I still insist on participation. I still, even though we're not doing the grapevine and we're not doing jumping jacks and we're not doing any of the leg lifts, we're not doing any of those things. I still, man, I want them in it. I don't want to just talk at them. I want them to enter into it, but I, there's just nothing that if you, if you, if, if a group of women will loosen up enough to, to laugh, or or weep mm -hmm. or just show that they're thinking meditating over it, groaning about some portion of scripture whatever it may be still to this day i looked at the just last weekend and when i said bye to them i got a lump in my throat this group that i'd never met before i got there that friday and said what else in this world could be better than yeah. breaking open your bible with a group mm -hmm. of women yeah. Amen to that. Okay. So mm -hmm. I want to take you, I'm sure you'll remember this, but you do so many, um, but several years ago in your hometown, Houston, you hosted a conference for young gals like me at yes. the time. Um, yes. called lit. And it was one of those moments, I think to where, I mean, I had always loved and admired just how God had used you and your obedience, but that weekend, I got to see a woman after God's heart. And like, mm. it's just like you just pulled back the veil and are like, all right, girls, come in close. This is what's going to yeah. hold you and tether you the yes. rest of your life. Yes. And it was such an intimate and vulnerable weekend. And I think a lot of what you taught us in that weekend is what has sustained me through the, the rest of ministry. And so I would love to kind of go back to that and even kind of have you Dude. open up for our listeners because there was something so beautiful about um, everybody knowing Beth Moore on a stage, being able to preach and laugh and, you know, do all of the amazing gifts that you have. But then you fully showing us if you do not tether yourself to the Lord mm -hmm. intimately in your own personal mm -hmm. walk, you will not make it. So you won't make can it. You, can you tell us a little bit just about pulling back that veil? What does that inner walk with the Lord? Yes. Look like yes. I, I wish, I wish you could see my arms. Maybe you could see it oh. because I've got, I've got chill bumps on my arms and um, because 
this conversation that we're having this this is this is not a game i know it's not to you either this this is this is life to us mm -hmm. and that we persevere in our in our faith to to get to that finish line and and be able to somehow say with the apostle paul i have fought the good fight i have finished the race i have kept the faith and somebody listening needs to know that of all things that the enemy is after i do believe there is a very real and vile enemy and there is very real principalities um at at play and um and and this present darkness and of all things he wants to take. Yes, he wants to take our integrity. Yes, he'd like to take our ministries. Yes, he'd like to take our marriages, um, th those who are married. Yes, he'd like to do all manner of destructive thing um, in our lives, but more than anything else, he wants to strip us of our faith. Mm -hmm. And our faith has to be nurtured. That's not, that's something we get from Jesus himself. And here is what I know, and I'll, I'll let your questions guide me on how specific I get. This, I promise you at my age in my mid sixties that I can say over you who are either in, I'm trying to think who might be listening in, in your teens, your twenties, your thirties, your forties, your fifties, or your sixties. If you're in your sixties and you've had a very long journey, you will, um, you will probably feel exactly the same way. And that is it jesus himself is what makes all of this worth it when some i was just asked earlier today how have you had such resilience i do not have a fancy answer the only answer i've got is jesus himself is knowing that no matter what is going on there is no person that is like jesus that there's no time we're going to be hurt or wounded or we ourselves are going to disappoint our ourselves and devastate ourselves and all the things that happen there at no point are we reflections of the reality of who jesus actually is yes i mean we we bear his image but i mean there there i love the way a friend of mine said it he said jesus is not just a big us and, and that's the truth that mm -hmm. he is altogether different and all together holy so that's got to stay intact and when so often jackie i i bet you get this question as often as i do it's just that i've gotten it for longer years because i've lived so much longer but the question comes up constantly how do you make time for your own private relationship with jesus and i, I it's very important to me that you guys know i'm not trying to be hyper spiritual here i'm not trying to make things sound better than they are i've had a very messy journey i've wobbled all over the place but i'm just going to tell you that that is not up for grabs or i'm dead mm -hmm. i'm dead in the water mm -hmm. I, my my calling is beyond me i don't have the capacity in my natural self to make good and sound and wise decisions i was too prone to the ditch I am wholly dependent on Jesus. If he does not come through for me or if he is not there, if I don't have that, I got nothing. And so I just want to say to every person listening, back, back it all the way up. And the one thing that does not go anywhere, that has to stay intact. We have to have that or we'll get devastated by people. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll devastate ourselves mm -hmm. and we won't, we won't be able to make it. Yeah. So can you, and this is kind of putting you on the spot, but I mean, I saw and continue to see that tethering, but at the same time, like leadership is hard and people so hard. stupid hits that are not in any way founded and just the, the dysfunction and hope, but then that being squelched by cynicism and yes, just yes. That. Yes. So take us to moments, even recently to where, you know, there is this identity attached to Jesus, but then there's also this constant attack. And so what does that look like for you to fight discouragement and to not, not be overcome by all of the loud voices? Like, how do you practically fight that right now? That is a really, really good question. And it is a day-to-day -day thing. And so, so like today, I have 
I have very little of that just in the course of today. Tomorrow, I might have a fresh backlash of it. And then I'm like, so, and some days I handle it better than others. But one of the things that I, I try to practice over and over is that the first voice that I've got to hear is is the voice of God through the pages of scripture. And that it's, and I don't want to be legalistic with you. You got to figure out what what works for you in the way that you pursue him in the spiritual disciplines but for me that usually i mean there there are occasions i may be on vacation there may be, i don't mean that i don't ever sleep late i'm just saying on a regular basis the very first voice i need to hear is god's voice out of the pages of scripture or i am going to believe what the world says about me the other thing that i have to deal with is that i i have to listen enough to where I know where they've got a point. Mm -hmm. I have learned some things from my criticism that I have implemented into my ministry life. I realized how many times I would reference and God really spoke to me and da da da. And of course I meant through his Holy Spirit into my heart. Now I'm going to interpret it in words, but it's mostly an impulse, the leadership of the spirit. And I realized, well, I, the, I, we very often speak in a language that we were raised on. And so that was very common in my, in my circles, in my Christian circles that we would talk like that. My teachers would talk like that. No one thought anyone was hearing an audible voice. No one never occurred to anyone. I never knew anyone that really had a vision. No one thought we were talking about that. We were talking about impulses, the Holy Spirit's leadership in our inner man. But I realized that's, that's misleading. I need to, I need to adjust that other parts of it were so mean, like, um, I'd have to make the decision to not be tremendously self aware. The next time I went out to speak, for instance, I've got such big features, I've got such big eyes, and there's just nothing like three inch um, thick glasses <laughs> to, to help maximize those big eyes, but you know, such big features. And so, you know, I'd see things like, you know, some people call me crazy eyes and have these pictures that were, you know, frozen. So in that situation, I'd have to literally make the choice the next time I spoke, you know, don't, don't you give way to that. And if you look silly to somebody, you know, just minister with all your heart. And so it's a constant, it's constantly doing this. What fits? What do you need to hear? Um, what is just mean? And what do you just blow off and what do you bring to the Lord and go that really hurt my feelings and that the you know the mockery is just like that that really hurts how do I keep that Lord and I don't I never go looking for it never Jackie and I'm sure that you don't either so mm -hmm. I'm only seeing what's coming directly at me mm -hmm. but so I have to make that decision and so at the end of the day and this is not going to be very helpful to somebody but I, I this is what I get out of it at the end of the day when the shoe doesn't fit when it's just mean when it's just mean or when it's not true, you referenced this just a moment ago, every, every now and then we'll hear something about ourselves that we're just thinking like, where did you even come up with that? Yep. <laughs> I, I one time heard that I had gotten over, I guess it goes back to the crazy ass, but I had been delivered from a cocaine addiction. I've never what? snorted cocaine in my life. Now I have done other things one might consider worse, but I, the fact is I've never snorted cocaine in my life. But all that to say at the end of the day, I felt like what the Holy Spirit would remind me of is, well, was it humbling? Yes. Okay. Then it's not without value. And so that's, that's that line because there's going across that line. There's getting so discouraged. We don't want to come out anymore. And there's that, but to stay this side of it and to know the difference between being wounded and then being just hacked up with a, a machete. Mm -hmm. And when we need the Lord to just, take us to the side for a while and let us heal. Those are very important things, very.
Yeah. And I so appreciate you sharing that. And even as you were talking about having to hear his voice first, like that's a discipline that I learned that weekend yes. and that I really now and teach to my women because it is so true. There's so, I'm so happy to hear that coming at us. And yes. it's such a life changer, I believe, to hear from your dad and hear just truth and grace and yes. then go into your day. And so I yes. love that you share that. But then I also think that there is this real tangible example of you've been through the hard, you've been through false accusations and attacks and what so oftentimes our flesh and the woundedness will cause is bitterness and wanting to attack mm -hmm. and come back even harder. And I think one of the things that I have learned from you is that humility, but then also not letting that discouragement or even that attack drown out my voice and drown out who God yes. has made me be to be right. And yes. I appreciate like the wisdom in that, but also the courage to continue to keep going because the easiest thing would be to get mad and walk away or get yes. mad. And try yes. to <laughs> I was thinking as you were saying that Jackie, um, say for instance, we've got like the line is like this. I mean, it's that thin. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, it is so easy to cross over. I can be a smart aleck. So sometimes I handle it well. And then other times I cross that line and I'm like, because I can scratch back. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very rarely, uh, it's an off thing just last week. I had to block a woman and I have given her several years now. And I, I thought, you know, I, you do not know how hard it is for me to block a woman. Uh, it is against my, the nature of the ministry God has called me to. I will block a man. I'll block a man like that if he's just, you know, really disesteeming and rude. But mm -hmm. I tell you, it is just the last, it is the last straw for me that I finally come to a point where I do that. And it will be ordinarily, I, you know what, I'm going to put you out of some of your misery, which is you've got to be miserable, fixating on all the things you don't like about me every day. And I'm going to put me out of the misery of having to see it. Mm -hmm. But to stay on this side of it, where it is a for me, I mean, it is a constant, I'm doing this, you know, I'm doing this and having to uh, come back on and go, I'm, I'm so sorry. And maybe I misunderstood you or I just was rude and said, shouldn't have come back that way. But just to kind of own it, because I'm going to tell you, I feel for us in, in one huge way. We did not see social media coming. Mm -hmm. We certainly did not see the divisiveness that hit us in 2015, 2016, 2017, and onward, we're, we're just now figuring out how toxic this whole place could be. And what I'm trying to do is grow in the grace of try to make this place, whatever, or get off. If I can't do that, if I can't somehow try to be edifying in those circumstances, then get the heck off of it. But to all to be differential, but to not give up your calling is also very important. And what I have to go by then, Jackie, is the same thing that you do. And I have to just go by to the degree that I understand it. I have to go by the leadership of the spirit. In other words, if, you know, I'm prayed up, and I still, and I have that rise up in me where I feel like the Lord is giving me the thumbs up to speak back. Um, I will tell you what often the line is going to be for me. I have a hard time shutting up if I think that what is being said is misleading and very poisonous to people being to being able to complete their calling then like the woman thing i just mm -hmm. i have a very hard time keeping my mouth shut on that because half the gospel force on the globe mm -hmm. is female yep yep <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> amen <laughs> there's so much um, yeah, but I won't go there. 
I want to go here, I think, because I know we're out of time and I want to be um, very intentional in this because I think you have paved a way for so many of us coming behind you. And I know even in your graciousness, you think women that paved the way for you, you know, yes. like always lineage of pavers and grace and yes. how God is using one another. But here's where I think I want to kind of wrap up this session because you are a voice for women and so many of us listening, so many of us that whether it be Twitter or within our own church walls or on the streets, like there is so much noise and yes. distraction and discouragement that is happening around the conversation of women in the church. And it doesn't matter what denomination you are. It doesn't it matter. Does. It doesn't That's matter. Right. Like there's That's so right. many things that I think the enemy is using. So I think I would love to hear, especially because you are still moving and shaking and ministering and leading and getting to meet with women and pray with women weekly. I mean, like, mm. we're, you're still doing this. And so mm. where do you see God using women? Like, I want you to almost just kind of brag on what God is doing. Oh, women. I will. And I tell- think I'd love to do that, Jackie. I think one thing that your generation, I love what I'm seeing I know you guys are are fighting hard. Just and, and remember that we we fight the good fight and not the ugly fight. Just keep that in mind that we fight the good fight. We fight for people, not with people. Now, if I've got to fight with someone to fight for someone, I'm willing to do that. But we just fight the good fight. But I see some wonderful things happening. And one of the things that I think your generation got that my generation did not understand is that the the multitude of ways that God can use us Mm -hmm. in his gospel work, there literally is not a field you could go into unless it is literally illicit or illegal or so, you understand what I'm saying? If it is honest, ethical work, there is nothing you cannot do and do for the glory of God and to do for the sake of the gospel and let your life live into that gospel message that in that day in and day out of being in that atmosphere, that circle of influence, um, you'll notice I'm thinking of someone who says, well, I don't get to say a lot at my school as a teacher, but I'm going to ask you something. Do do your teacher friends and peers and colleagues know who to call when they need prayer? I bet they do. I bet they do because it's coming through more than you know. I think y'all have got that. I think you understand that be it government or at, in the medical field or whether it is um, in the uh, in the uh, in homemaking, in the housekeeping field, whatever it could be in teachers, lawyers, I don't care what field it is you can be called of God in that work. And so I say that because we can get in our head in my day when I felt the call of God, it was like, to what? (laughs) I mean, honestly, the only thing I could think of a woman, I I must be going to the mission field. Well, I didn't feel called to the mission field. And I've had a lot of uh, friends along the way say, well, I I felt like I was called to be a, a pastor's wife. I did not I didn't feel I didn't have any. It was just like your best way I know to describe my calling was that Holy Spirit making clear to my heart, you're mine. You just do what I tell you to do. But I, I want to say that I see that. I see that. I think I see also I'm very, very frustrated over some of the things happening in regard to women's roles because I see them. I see so much extremism. But I, the good side of it is, Jackie, we're having to go to the scriptures. We're having to do our homework. We're having to do our homework. We're having to chance being misunderstood. These are things, if we look at Luke 10, if we look at Matthew 10, I love that both of those are the 10th chapter because we can so easily remember those. When Jesus said what it was going to be like, he said, I'm going to send you out sheep among wolves you're going to have to be innocent as doves you're going to be shrewd as serpents you're going to you know he said it's going to be hard it's going to be hard and and it is it is what i ask of my brothers and my sisters both because there is many women who are 
against women in ministry as there are men. But what yeah. I ask is consistency with the example of Jesus, that he there is no way in any part of the scriptures that anything would contradict. Everything has still got to work within the framework of the dignity that Jesus gave women. And so that's, that I just, I just feel over and over again to emphasize. And I think we're having to do our homework. I think that now it's being, being sloppy is it's over. And mm -hmm. a lot of women are having to really, really work hard to study it, to see, you know, what are, what are the things on the table for me? What are the things beyond that table for me? Yeah. Well, and I love um, just the example of that we are having to go to our scriptures. And I think yes. my own life and even like as a Bible teacher, like I did not want to teach women in the Bible because I felt like it was so cliche. Like it's like, OK, you have to teach Esther, you have to teach Ruth. And I'm like, I don't want to teach those. I want to teach other things. And as these conversations have happened, it has taken me to women in the Bible. Yes. And I, I love yes. them. And it almost has, and I mean, even writing the book, you know, like there is just so much goodness. And as I have these conversations with women and they're seeing women in redemptive history and seeing and connecting their stories with the Ruths or with the Deborah. Absolutely. You know, like all of those women. And so as much as this has become an argument where there's a lot of mud flinging, I do see so much grace and good women falling in love with their Bibles and their God, because God is who has been faithfully using women from Genesis one all the way to today. And that's so exactly I, it. I love that too. And I see that, I think of my own life, I see it in women around me. And so there's such an encouragement, I think to do the work, like go chase God and see what, he's saying, see what he's doing. Give him the yes, right? Yes. Give him that. Yes. Give him the yes. Well, let's do this. Beth, I would love for you to maybe just pray over our listeners, because like oh, we said, there to. are a, just a lot of discouraged women. There's women that are just kind of questioning like, okay, God, I know your Holy Spirit is calling me to do something, but I don't know what, and I'm scared to give my yes. And yes. So I would love for yeah. you to pray over women of the church, our sisters. Oh. And for I'd be so happy to. I'd be so happy to. Lord, I was just thinking because I was about to burst out and say something else. And I thought, oh, there's so much more value in praying it instead of just saying it. And so I'm just going to pray it out before you that, uh, Lord, that we would not be discouraged, that we would not be dismayed, that we go back to those scriptures that tell us, oh, do not be discouraged and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Lord, we've got to know the scriptures. So one of the ways I really want to pray for um, all of us uh, that are tuned in is that we will go to your word because we do want to live consistently with what um, what your word teaches and, and with what the gospel call is. And we want to know how it is we are empowered by the spirit to be witnesses. But this we know that is the calling that however it may take place, whatever it looks like. I also want to encourage someone that 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 we not just look for the thing we are supposed to do, but we know that Father, we're this is so much of ministry is really organic as we go. It's, these are living words coming into a, a an ab abundantly lived life. It may look different this year from next year. It may look different in the season of, um, say, for instance, parenting young children than it's going to look like when they're uh, in high school, or for the single um, woman who is under 30 and the single woman who is over 60 and 70 that lord we just let you like what do you want how could i follow you here and lord i think that what i want to um encourage someone in is that we would just have our ears open and our eyes open to need that really to meet the next need to um hear where people are hurting, see where people are hurting, and and just lend a hand in the name of Jesus. Um, quicken your word through the Holy Spirit to us. Give us the end result. I ask you this for every single one of us, that the end result of all Bible study, of every spiritual discipline, of all things, 
will not be that we are smarter or even more equipped for ministry. It will be that we love you more than we did when we started. So I ask you that. Let that be the end result, that what shines for us, we are going to make mistakes. So let it be that what stands out more than anything else is that woman loves Jesus. And we're going to be all right. I thank you, Lord. I thank you that we can anticipate you at the end of this race. Keep our eyes fixed on you and run toward that finish line. I adore you. I thank you so much for Jackie and all you are doing through her in the glorious and beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, Beth, thank you so much for sharing some of your time, a lot of your wisdom, and so much grace and truth today. Thank you for joining us. Jackie, I'm so happy to have been here. Thank you. And as always, we are so thankful that you spent some time with us today at the table, and we look forward to you joining us next week for another episode. We'll see you then.